One of the, if not the most nutrient dense foods on the planet as defined by a food that contains every essential nutrient that you need to survive and live. In other words, you can eat this and be okay and eat nothing else. There's only one type of food that fits this category. It's meat. That's right, this is a fact, okay? This is unequivocal. Meat contains every single essential nutrient, macronutrient and micronutrient you need to live for your body to function. It's extremely nutrient dense. Now, just eating meat is not ideal, but removing meat from your diet, whoa, you better make up for that with other foods and typically supplements. So when you hear people say, hey, get rid of meat, don't eat meat, you need to do a lot of research and a lot of work to make up for all those nutrients you are missing when you stop eating meat. Bringing this up because the push. Brought to you by Big Beef. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I right. wish they sponsored us. That'd be awesome. I know, I'd be all for it. <laughs> Just throw us a steak every once in a while. Uh, <clears throat> I'm saying this because I brought this up on, on an earlier podcast about the UN is making a call to um, their, you know, their, uh, I don't know, member nations to reduce meat consumption, in particular America. Oh, I see. Now, now, here's the problem. Okay. Now, here's the problem with that. And those of us who work in the health space understand this, okay? The average American consumes a majority of their calories from heavily processed foods. This is a fact. In fact, when you go to grocery stores, 73% of the calories in a grocery store, typical grocery <coughs> store, this is confirmed, comes from heavily processed foods. The average American, a majority of their diet is made up of heavily processed foods. When you look at the remaining whole natural foods, which is what we're always advocating for, I don't think anybody will say, yeah. That a whole natural food diet. Meat, eggs, dairy. Is, it's meat, eggs, and dairy. Yeah. That's a majority. <laughs> They're not eating a lot of other whole natural foods. Yeah. It, that's pretty much it. So if you convince a bunch of everyday people who already don't plan their diets, who are already not health and fitness fans, the average person, mm -hmm. and you just scare the hell out of them, or you tax meat into oblivion, or you ban meat and make it so people can't purchase it, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. They're going to replace it They're with more deficient. of what they already eat a lot of heavily processed foods. And what that will result in is a sicker population, a fatter population, a population with less muscle, with more anxiety, more depression as a result of nutrient deficiencies, not a great trade. So uh, that's the reason why I'm bringing this up. It's like, so I we, agree with you 100% on this. My question I have for you, though, is do you subscribe to it being this big you know, conspiracy to make people weaker and sicker? Or do you think it's... It's less nefarious, and it's just this is the easiest path to patenting food that we can make more money and control the food industry even more. Like, where, what do you think? And I don't think that's a conspiracy. I think that's like the yeah. obvious path to yeah. me. I think that there's there's a few different things at play. There's the uh, the climate <laughs> worshippers. <clears throat> where they place the climate, right? Environment, climate as so I just th I think top those, value. I think to that point, I think those are just useful idiots. I think the agenda is still to make money and it's easy to, to, yes. to play to but that. But there's, there's, there's more than one thing that's making this happen. So that's one, right? One of them is- Cornering the market. People worship the climate. It's everything. Kill all the humans. Everything bends to this top value. Every other value is less than that. So if people are more sick, people have more anxiety, more depression, less innovative, et cetera, et cetera. Even people will even call humans a cancer uh, on earth is, is a common one. So that is part of it. Then you have a lot of markets that profit off of people who are, who are not, quote unquote, balanced and healthy. Now, I don't necessarily think they sit down and say, we want people to be sick. But if you look at their products, their products are typically consumed by people who are less healthy or consume more by people who are less healthy. So if you look at someone who's like, <coughs> think of someone who's fit and healthy and balanced, they're less likely to buy all these products, consume much, as much of the same media, you know, basically do the same kind of stuff. So their incentives are in that direction. And then what you said, I think is a big one, which is uh, you can create lots of patented processed foods, GMO products, very profitable to do so. And if we need to sell it, under the guise of we're saving saves the earth. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, this is a, a, a value. It's great for everybody. It's good for the earth, and therefore, let's do it. Um, then, then they'll do so. So I think there's I, there's multi factors. Yeah. Tinfoil, I think, I think you, <clears throat> we we've seen like uh, a lot of examples of this in terms of like uh, low 
low fat, like in, in eliminating fat out of your diet and like, you know, other like focuses in terms of like which foods that we all need to focus on. I feel like this, it's, it's sort of a trends thing. Right. And so it starts out as like veganism is, um, I, I've seen like a big movement and push in that direction. I, I have, I've seen, uh, lately I've seen a lot of push back against it. And so you see like the carnivore kind of diet emerge. And then you see like people like swarming over to that. There was Atkins before. So I think that it, in terms of capturing the market and like capitalizing on that, I think that there was opportunity there now to like, we have the technology to make uh, this fake meat. And so like in order to get people to buy into it, we were going to force them in that direction. And so I think a lot of it is like now that, that there's more control over the way that consumers uh, get information and like, they, like, we all have the same information on our phone, but they can control that a lot more. And you've seen them manipulate, you know, algorithms and ways people like receive information. So the nefarious part for me is that it's like, you know, whether it's like trying to make a sick and all that kind of stuff. And it's like a real devious plot. Uh, I mean, you can go down that rabbit hole all you want, but I just think in terms of us having to, uh, having access to information, like they can control a lot of the information we receive. And so to, to inform the consumers that this is the direction we need to go is an agenda that businesses have. Yeah. yeah I don't, I mean, I, uh, I don't, I don't think it's this crazy plot to make us sick. I think, I think that also just plays into the favor too of like, that, that plays into the, uh, you know, the medical industry. Oh yeah. That's a huge market. So it's like, or, yeah. uh, you're not, so you have the food and the medical industry, like two of the biggest industries that are out there. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, we're going to get it. We're going to push them over to processed foods. That'll probably make them more sick. Yeah. You'll probably make more money. Look so at they're not, partnering now with GLP. Right. And the, so, yeah. you know, so you got the, you got, you got the medical community is not going to push hard back on it because yeah. they're just going to send them more customers. You yeah, got the I'm food gonna, industry, I'm, it's in their best interest to make more money. That's right. So I do think like your point about like the zero fat, like movement that we had in like the late nineties or whatever like that. I think that's the same thing. I think it was driven by the same thing. I don't think it was, even though it ended up making people sicker and unhealthier, like we saw this firsthand, right? How many times did you have a female client after training them and then realizing like, oh shit, she's eating under 20 grams of fat, all these issues that she's having, all I had to do is bump her fat to 80, 90 grams a day. And all of a sudden, all everything these, goes away. Everything goes away. Yeah. So we saw it firsthand how, what that started to do to people because they didn't know any better. <laughs> So I, I, I do think that, I think that was a result of it. I don't think that was a desired outcome. I think the desired outcome was, oh, let's create a new niche market of non-fat milk and fake butter and all this stuff like well, that. Well, look, I'll give you an example. Uh -huh. There was that study that showed, so when people get hospitalized for depression, it's pretty bad. Like you're, you're, you're pretty bad. They did a study where they had a group of, uh, they took groups of people who were hospitalized and they put them in rooms where the there was a window that faced uh, the east. Oh, I remember. So this. the rising sun would come and shine through the window. Yeah, they were in there. They were hospitalized significantly less than people who weren't in <clears> rooms <throat> like that. Now, do you think it's in the best interest of these hospitals to build rooms that allow for more sunlight to come in with the rise? Do you think that that's in their best interest, or do you think it's in their best interest to have people stay a little longer? Yeah. Right. So I don't necessarily think people are like evil at the top, but the incentives don't move towards making people there's a, there's ethical healthy. issues there's definitely ethical issues that uh, you see like that and you're like no they wouldn't like somebody wouldn't like intentionally have those windows facing that way because they know that it'll keep them a little bit sick or but if you're looking at your bottom line and you're looking at um, the fact that a hospital is a business and like when they don't have patients, they're losing money all the time. And so, and two, with the whole COVID thing, it's like you see incentives for, for people to report things because it's <laughs> like, you know, you have to like make money at the end of the day in order to keep things afloat, pay your and employees and all that kind of stuff. So you're making these justifications unethical dust justifications a lot like sometimes it, it's going to happen well incentives matter look I'll, I'll paint the picture just so people because people are like oh people aren't evil i know people who work in the medical industry they're good people so do i i think they're i've met i've trained and worked with lots of doctors i have family members that are nurses they're all amazing people they all want to help people so i don't think that there's these evil whatever i'm sure there's some but i think a majority of them are are good people but imagine this scenario presented you're a corporation you own these massive hospitals or you're uh, a medical organization that works with these hospitals. And a study comes out that says uh, sunlight, uh, if, you know, windows that face the east 
reduce hospitalization by this percentage. And then another study comes out that says taking this antidepressant at this time when people are hospitalized reduces hospitalizations. Which one do you think is going to get more attention? Yeah, the pill. Right. Which one is going to get more like uh, not just attention, but more adherence, more application? It, and it's not necessarily because people are um, nefarious. It's just that's what the incentives push you towards, right? So meat, uh, eating, and the studies are clear on this, very clear. Look at people who don't eat meat. Nutrient deficiencies are higher. Depression is higher. Anxiety is higher. Okay, this is a fact. It's a fact because of the lack of nutrient-dense foods. The nutrients that are present in meat are more easily absorbed. They're more bioavailable, and they're just they're just higher. In order to make up for that with a non-animal product diet, you can do it. You can do it. We have modern you know markets. You can go to the grocery store and get all kinds of different things now, any time of the year. Okay. But it takes a lot of planning. You got to be very careful. And even then, even then, I've worked with clients like this where they were meticulous about their vegan diets. Even then, they couldn't get certain nutrient levels where they needed. And they begrudgingly, I remember one woman in particular, I worked with her. She was a vegan for ethical reasons. She did not want animals to get hurt. So she was one of those vegans that's like, and those are the ones that tend to be consistent, right? They really, really truly believe like, I don't want animals to get hurt. And she, man, she planned everything out. She worked with a functional medicine practitioner and me. She hired me. She had all these symptoms of nutrient deficiencies and hormone issues. We bumped her calories. I had her try vegan protein shakes. Uh, it, it just, there were certain things that just weren't, weren't working. Okay. Her hair was still kind of falling out. Energy was still not so great. Nails and skin weren't so good. You know, functional medicine practitioners doing tests on her is like these nutrient levels still aren't coming up. She started taking supplements. The supplements helped a little bit, but they didn't help a lot. Um, some of them caused digestive issues. Finally, I mean, we had this, her and I had this conversation and I said, you know, you're doing everything right. It's just not working for your body. I know you want to help animals. I said, I think a healthy version of you is going to be more effective than an unhealthy version. And you have to place yourself at the top. You can't be effective at helping anything if you're constantly sick and you don't feel good. And she was, I remember she was in, she was in tears. She gave in and she started by eating eggs. And the difference in her health was profound. It was so profound that I remember she would come in and she was, she was like one of those people that was like pro vegan, but also doesn't work for everybody. And you got to do this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's just hard. And so if you take a bunch of everyday Americans who don't plan anything with diet yeah. and you remove the nutrient yeah, dense we're whole foods, problem if, yeah. holy cow, we're going to have all kinds of health and mental health issues and health issues. And yeah, the food industry will profit massively, massive. By the way, the lab grown meat, you know, what's beautiful about lab grown meat. You patent it. Mm -hmm. If my lab grows meat, I can make it. <clears throat> yeah. It, that's, Sal's ribeye. To whatever. me, that's the biggest, yeah. I think that's the, the biggest thing going on here. It's just that it, they're moving in that direction yeah. and it's, it's in their best interest. And so the, the narrative's going to be around why you shouldn't. And I, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, this is the, the challenge of free markets, right? Yeah. It, that's in their best interest to make that money and put that message out. Only thing we can do is counter it with better information. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you, the question, yeah, well, it's just our job to inform. You know, people. Well, here's why I point people just not to cut you off. But I point people to this. Uh, there are ways of raising animals that are far more ethical uh, not like the conventional style. Um, you can uh, grass fed. It's more natural uh, with the beef. It's going to have better fatty acid profile. The animals are treated differently. Um, and thankfully, because of markets, yeah. you can now get it. And it used to be so expensive. Like Butcher Box, for example, look at the cost of the box of meat that you get. <clears throat> You're not spending more money. It's actually convenient. It's better. And you've got ethically raised like wild caught, fi wild -caught fish, grass fed beef, Heritage pork, you know where it's coming from. You, if you want, you can contact the company, figure this all out. I was going to bring up. Healthier. I was going to bring up Butcher Box. Do you know if they're like, are they campaigning against a message like this, or do they just ignore it? Yeah, do you that's know? an interesting question. That's yeah. a good question because it's like a direct shot across the bow yeah. at them, right? I mean, that's their business. I would now. almost, yeah, I would almost want to. And like, yeah, me too. I, I'm surprised. I don't think I've seen anything. At least I haven't heard anything from our end, like of them sending out stuff where they're like actually. Good question. I mean, you would think that they they would do that, or, or maybe at least a comparison, you know, and like right. look at the value of the nutrients. 
nutrients and whatnot, you know. Or maybe there's to, enough to people or, that are subscribed and and that are are not even that are not even listening to that message that it doesn't it's not hurting them like that. But I would think that it would affect their business. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I maybe heard. not yet, but maybe in the future. You know, my favorite part of this whole movement is: Have you seen? Yeah, people are, people are actually doing this. Have you seen these uh, vegan cat foods? Oh God, yeah, <laughs> dude, you're taking a carnivore. <laughs> they're not even. They're just like a carnivore. Yeah. And you're like, I'm gonna make you eat. You know, vegan this stuff animal is, cruelty right there. Cat. Like, come on, man. They're not. Yeah, it's it's not benefiting these poor animals oh, at what all. Is, what did that say right there, Doug? So, yeah, so we partner, this is Butcher Box, according to them. We partner with people who are dedicated to doing the right thing. Uh, so they always do 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, humanely raised, never given antibiotics or hormones. Um, so they do focus very seriously. So I, 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 I have a super naive question. What is the difference between like a grass-fed, and I should know this, right, because I was in the dairy and farm industry. What is the difference between like a grass-fed uh beef farm versus a regenerative is it the same thing is so if you are doing grass fed is it considered a regenerative farm or is, is they, there, they they're tip if, if they're typically uh yes but they're not always the same so you could can just you look that up for me doug i'm just yeah, curious they could just bring uh, um grass to the to the cows have a meat um i see or regenerative is when they're using the land and cycling through and using all of the land using the manure to fertilize so they uh, sort of cycle where they eat yeah i think they move them from pasture, to pasture. no i know that about grass-fed beef that right. i'm familiar with that what i'm not familiar with is what constitutes it regenerative Look versus that, that. Regenerative. okay because i actually am not familiar with any situation where you bring grass to cows you wouldn't do that yeah you would I, you you would you would feed them silage and you would feed them cornmeal and stuff like that does that That's, incorporate more of the ecosystem of other animals and stuff to kind of like yeah, because they, tra they trample through. the ground and they and they no that's what I've read that's yeah. what uh, what's his name talked about Rob Wolf Rob Wolf yeah, yeah. look yeah. that up look up because what is regenerative farming? farming there's there's other animals that play a, a big role in that in order to like keep um, a lot of the vegetation and stuff uh, in the soil for instance from uh, I just know it's sure become a real popular buzzword in, in that community and I mean I'm I came from an organic dairy so and we we moved the cattle like from pasture to pasture they were grass fed but we also uh they were able to grain finish those those cows but the, what i didn't know the difference is like okay what makes it regenerative versus non-regenerative if it's if you are going an all organic route you're going all grass fed would that just automatically fall in that category yeah, what does that say doug well i'm looking at this trying to get a an answer that's kind of clear uh but what they're saying is, is it really is just the ability to roam freely. Um, that's the main point that I'm seeing as far as that okay. is concerned. Yeah, I'm no, I mean, for sure, every time we do something like this, where we're not, none of us have a definitive answer, <sighs> I will get 50 DMs. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I got it. Us, <laughs> no, no, get, a, get a legit so, farmer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, I got it. I got it. It says us. regenerative agriculture. Oh, look at right there. Who's got this? Is that you, yeah. Andrew? Okay, good. All right, so what, look at look at the, look at there's three here. So, so go to go to 100% regenerative grass fed beef. What does that say up there? Then, Can someone read that or so maybe right expand here that? The top point it just says genuinely regenerated and 100% grass fed beef comes from animals that lived on pasture foraging on nothing but grasses from birth to harvest. Okay. The true definition of grass fed and grass finished. Uh, well, look at the one on the right though. Right next to it is what is what's considered uh, grass fed, but not. So go go yeah, grass fed beef right here. A lot of fake grass fed beef is meant to mean genuine, regenerative, and 100% grass fed beef comes from animals that lived on pasture. But okay, but this is not always the case. Meant to have access to a pasture, but not always the case, and could be extremely limited. Many grass fed cattle are in refinement, but fed some grass. Yeah, see, that's what I thought. Like they literally throw it in their feed. I see. So I was actually reading from the Butcher Box page there. And, uh, you know, it says if you're buying grass fed beef, you're maybe not getting what you think you are. Typically, grain-fed or grass-fed cattle start their lives on pasture but are later confined to feedlots where their diets can include grains. Wow, so they can so they can consider it still grass-fed if mm -hmm. they started their life on that. And That's then, why it has to say grass-fed. Okay. So grass-fed, grass-finished cattle, also known as 100% grass-fed, are free to roam on pasture for their entire lives, not just when they're calves. Do you know what? So I, I always thought that, mm -hmm. the, so the, the cutoff, I thought, I don't know, so like this is more, more questions that would be, somebody else can answer better. That if it was grass fed, as long they they could do it all the way, they had to do it all the way up to their final like two weeks before slaughter, and then they would they would fatten them up by mm -hmm. and putting grain and silage and everything in their feed. But they still were most of their lives, I thought, grass fed. But from what that sounds like, 
you don't even need to do that. They it's all the way through. There's yeah. a lot of trickery going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, you can literally, you know, that's the shitty part about the, you know what I'm saying? And that's the argument the other side makes for this stuff. I don't think, is it two weeks out? I think it's longer than that. No, that's, I mean, that's what I, I in order to still like call. How, would that be enough time to change the fat in the Two animal? weeks of overeating? It would. Oh, yeah. With yeah. cows. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off this guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. With the, it, humans too, anybody. I mean, you- I mean, you, I've tried to bulk like that. That's you, <laughs> <laughs> they, they have another gear, bro. They can handle a lot I mean, of food, you, I, you could, I remember scooping grain and silage to a cow. Like they'll eat whatever you put in front of them. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll, go, they'll continue to just eat. In fact, I can't remember, recall a time Oh, well, if a cow, that's how you knew a cow was sick, right? So if you pour their, especially the grain and silage, which they love, you pour that in their in their trough, I mean, they suck it down. If they left something, you always tag that cow. Something's wrong with 487. You know, something's wrong with 519. Like, they didn't finish their, their wow. you just know. Like, Did you they, help them uh, produce, like, calf? Like, how do you, do you have, what, what do you have, one bull for how many cows? How did that work? One. One bull, and then that was, I mean, we only had for a how herd. many cows? We only had a, we only had a herd of 150. 50 something one bowl so we for 150 cows yeah 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 <laughs> well they so so they, you remember that the heifers only come in they only come in heat they, they're just they come in heat at different times so let's say you have like 15 in heat you see the signs that they're in heat then you move what them are the in signs? uh i don't remember what uh i didn't this is not a part that i did a lot of like i i, I had they stand I, different <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I mean, honestly, I, I think I remember you seeing like like blood and stuff coming. coming oh, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. You would see, you would, yeah, mm -hmm. like discharge and stuff uh -huh. like that. If I recall, like, I don't, and then what do you do? What do you do? You just bring the bull in. He knows what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just you you just pasture them off in this in the same area. He's normally kind of hanging out by himself, but then when they're in heat, you move them in where they're in heat, and he'll go around and he'll 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 it fuck is, them all. Oh, huh? yeah, yeah. He'll he'll take it. I mean, it's a real quick action. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like. You don't even realize, like, really? Well, he's got 150, you know. Yeah. He ain't yeah. trying to take his time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and wow. It, yeah, that's an interesting question, too. I never I never thought to ask, like, what is the ratio? Like, there's got to be a point where you get more, where you want more, more. But we had, we were a small dairy. We only had 100, 130 to 150 cattle. I didn't know that, but there's still one bull for that many? Holy Toledo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. wow. That's a good, I, I've never hmm. thought about what the number, there's got to be a cutoff, though. Like, once you get to a certain amount, you would want a yeah, second. Yeah, the bull's just like, dude, yeah, relax. I would, I would Do you ever have ideas of like, I, so when I was in Scotland, they had these like uh, um, cows that, would they have these longhorn cows that were like super oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh man, I was like, I could totally like own a few of those guys. Oh, you know? they're huge. Just, the yeah, horns are huge. They actually have mini versions of them now. That's I saw. cute. Yeah, yeah, it was ridiculous. I, so look what it says. So I was right. It was so signs of heat standing to be mounted, mounting other cows. Wow. So yeah, you'll see the so heifer, cow will do it to you know, other. Yeah, cows? you'll see other heifer, just like you see with dogs, right? Male, two male dogs or two. You'll see them uh, mounting. Well, each those other. are heat and cattle, not the bulls. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Oh, okay. Same thing. You see the same sex of a dog. If, if they're yeah, in heat, yeah. they start doing, they start acting. But the big one is the mucus discharge. You'd see this mucus discharge uh -huh. and it'll have a little bit of blood in it and you would know. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Okay, it's time. Bellowing. Okay, so they are like, yes, doing yeah, nothing. I know. Yeah. Wow, that's why. Question is from Jay Schaefer WA. What's the difference between cycling calories, high days versus low days, as opposed to taking the average and eating that amount every day? Well, the biggest difference, because there are differences physiologically, but let's start with the psychological, because I think that's the most important thing to focus on. Real relaxed, balanced, healthy eating. And I say relaxed in the sense that you're not like counting every calorie and carrying food with you, right? But healthy, balanced, kind of relaxed eating, it's not going to look exactly the same every single day. I mean, it'll look similar. Most of us will eat the same thing for breakfast and lunch, but sometimes we'll go out for dinner. Sometimes we'll eat something different. We'll switch up the meat, whatever. So to eat the exact same calories and macros every single day just is highly unlikely. It just doesn't mirror real life. So it's a hard transition. It's, or I should I say it's a harder transition to go from there than it would be to have days that are higher carb, lower carb. The other thing is, uh, or higher calorie, lower calorie. The other thing is it allows you to, to pay attention to how you feel on days that are higher calorie or days that are lower calorie. Do I feel more sharp? Do I have more energy? Do I feel more groggy? More carbohydrates make me feel this way. More fat makes me feel this way. Higher protein makes me feel this way. Lower protein makes me feel this way. So it really, it's, it encourages you or it creates the environment where you can really pay attention to how your body feels. Now, physiologically, there's probably, 
a pro metabolism effect that happens from this. I think, especially when you're in a cut, eating low calorie all the time probably causes the metabolic adaptation where your metabolism slows down. You're probably seeing more of that happen versus some days are lower and other days are higher and some days are even above what you're burning. And that's been my experience. There's not a, not a lot of data to support that. There's a little bit that suggests it, but in my experience the fluctuating seems to work better across the board. I have two different opinions on this, um, and it depends on who I'm talking to. So I'm talking to a competitor uh, that is getting ready for a stage, which is a very small percentage of people that are listening to this. Um, I like the consistent same calorie every single day. It's just one less variable that we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what happened or didn't happen in a fluctuation of weight or change in body composition. It's just this. So it's like you eat this many calories every single day. This puts you in a it surplus or deficit. Yeah. Right. And so I'm looking at so many other variables. I don't want to eat that. And of course, that person is expected to be measuring, mm -hmm. weighing, tracking every detail. Right. If I'm talking to a person that is just normal general population that wants to be healthier, that wants to be fitter, I 100% am encouraging the up, the ups and downs, right? The the undulating the calories where one day's higher, one day's lower, learning to adjust it based off of how busy you are, your lifestyle, how you feel better. And that's just a more sustainable way to live. That's how I live if I'm not competing, right? If I'm just eating normal, it's like I have higher days, lower days, medium days. It's just this, this up and down. And it's not, I'm obsessing over hitting a certain uh, amount. So it really depends on who I'm communicating. As far as what the, the science says on it, one's better or not. I, I think we did a video, you and I did, Sal, years ago on the little bit of, of science that supports uh, the benefits of undulating, yeah. you know, that, that there's probably some sort of uh, adaption that happens if you're eating exactly the same amount of calories for a long time. And there's probably some benefits metabolically to, you know, fooling the body of you're going to get a lot one day, less than yeah. another day. And so there probably are some, but I, I think that's such splitting hair difference that that's not the reason why you would do it for more psychological totally. or lifestyle reasons. So if your general population, uh, the answer is there is no real major difference. I think it's better and healthier for you to learn how to undulate the calories. If you are a competitor and you are like dialing in, measuring, and paying attention to everything, you want to control I, the I like to keep it controlled. So here's an easy way to control your appetite, your energy, and to improve behaviors that lead to healthier eating. Here's an easy tip: start your day off with a high protein high fiber meal, both of which have been shown to control satiety for the entire day. In other words, you eat a breakfast that has a good amount of protein and a good amount of fiber, regardless of what you eat later on, you're less likely to have cravings and you're less likely to overeat. So this one simple tip alone can actually make a profound difference. Doug, will you look up for me um, for male, male and female average, uh, you know, minimum fiber intake. I want to say, you know, 25, 25. To 25 to 35 grams, yep. somewhere yep. in that range is like the bare minimum. 25 to 30. Yep. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Not bad. Not <laughs> On bad. Fire. Still, 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 around still exactly that still. amount. You know that fiber? <laughs> well, you know, the re, I, I like, I love this tip, Sal, because, and people have been listening to the show for a long time. I've heard us talk about, you know, one of the strategies that we use when we are dealing with the weight loss client, um, Ironically, when we get somebody who is trying to lose 50 to 100 pounds, uh, the first thing that we do is actually add to their diet, which seems like that seems weird. Why yeah. would you do you're that? Supposed to take away. Right. You're supposed to take away. And what what I found is like it's I'm adding things like fiber, like protein, like healthy fats because water. yeah, water. Like when I assess someone's diet, there's so much that they're they're missing. And instead of telling them they can't have something and and, and restricting them and, and playing that psychological game with them. I like to in, uh, uh, add something and, uh, and fiber is, I would say my, my top five uh, things that I would adjust at the beginning. And the thing that I thought was always really interesting about this was, uh, and we talked a little bit about this with Kelly Starrett is how many people are so disconnected from how their food is affecting their digestion and their stool. And just people thought that 
that that's how they poop all the time. Like is constipated and like this or yeah. don't shit for the I've, whole day. I had an explosive day today. Yeah, right. And, and, and they <laughs> just, just happens. They just chalk it up and have no idea, or they don't. They just uh, assume that's it's their genetics, I guess, or uh, you know how their body operates, or it's just the luck of the the roll of the dice. And it's like, <sighs> no, you're like you know constantly under eating in fiber. Once we get that right, watch, and they're like, oh my god, it feels so much I, better. I, I would. I'll yeah. I'll estimate that a good seventy percent of <clears throat> people who have issues with constipation would be solved by simply eating um, adequate amount of fiber and drinking enough water. Literally those two simple things yeah. right there. And, and now why, why do you want to be regular? Well, when you store your, your stool for longer than you should, so you're not full of shit. Yeah, that's right right there. <laughs> uh, but no, you, you like you can cause buildup of things like estrogen. One of the ways your body gets rid of estrogen, both men and women is through the stool causes inflammation, discomfort. Then all of that affects your behaviors, right? It can make you feel irritable, uh, low energy, which then can oftentimes, especially in modern society, leads to um, reaching for food as a comfort. And if you think about people who are obese, it's not because they're hungry all the time. It's because they have cravings and cravings come from trying to make yourself feel better um, through eating food. So if you feel good, you tend to eat uh, in a more healthy way. Um, when you feel bad, you tend to eat you know, worse off. This is why after a day of drinking, this is when people like yeah. the day after when you have a hangover, you tend to want to eat garbage. Or if you have poor sleep, you tend to want to eat garbage. But it's it's funny what you say, Adam, because it took us a long time to figure that out. Like we're literally giving people the cheat code right now. It took me 10 years to figure that out. Yeah, is I would tell people to hit their protein targets, hit their fiber targets, drink more water, which is adding, and then they would all lose weight. Right. Why? Because they ate less. Satiating. They were more satiated. Better behaviors. And also, too, I mean, who likes walking around with a distended gut? You know, and like a lot of times, too, like, I mean, there's bloat factor and all that, but like, you just don't have that perception of yourself in a positive light. And so it's like, you just kind of get into that uh, posture where, yeah. you know, everything is sort of like down. And so it's like, you're not bringing good energy uh, into, into your workouts, into like your activities going forward. So it's like all this stuff sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's like a one big loop you're in. Yeah. The, and the data, by the way, on fiber is pretty damn good. And lots of people actually think or have tried to make the argument that fiber should be considered an essential macronutrient. Now I know the argument against that, um, because I guess you could survive without fiber, but the, but the reason why there's an argument saying that it should be considered essential is because there's so much data that shows its uh, health benefits. Now, there are people on the other side of the spectrum, like the carnivore diet type people that say, oh, it's not essential or whatever. People who tend to respond really well to eliminating plants out of their diet have underlying autoimmune issues and the plants tend to trigger those. Yep. If you're in that category, that's different. Like if you're eating something that's triggering autoimmune issue, then that you need to focus on that first. But the vast majority of people, and again, the data is pretty damn good on this. I would also still challenge that too, by the way. I would, I would, and what I mean by that is that um, I, I would, I would challenge the person who feels that way about their their issues with uh, um, not eating vegetables, and they're on the carnivore diet for autoimmune issues, and finding vegetables that actually still agree with you that there's probably still some out there and, and like there's probably a couple major offenders that do that and so yeah. eliminating working that your way back yes them, i right? love I, and, and then so my argument would be that i bet you if you actually worked your way back to adding things like fruit and the vegetables that don't disagree with you that you would actually feel even better than what you do on just being on a carnivore diet. That would be my argument. I, well, I'll say this, that the the true percentage of people that really do uh, need to eat that way to improve their health is a small percentage. The rest of them are simply not doing what you're saying, where they actually try to reintroduce and figure out what the real offenders are. There is a small percentage though, like Michaela Peterson's a good example, mm -hmm. like severe autoimmune issues. Um, and, uh, she's very diligent. She's very in tune with what's going on. And I know I've known a couple people like this, um, by the way, uh, many times in those scenarios, not always, but many times in those scenarios, there's an underlying reason as to why foods are so triggering, why so many foods are so triggering. And when you solve that underlying issue, it's not a problem. Now for the vast, vast, vast majority of people, um, the data is pretty damn clear that fiber, um, has lots of health benefits. It's also up there with things that provide or produce satiety. Mm -hmm. Protein being at the top, fiber being pretty damn close. So if you start your day off with protein and fiber, 
then what you find is better eating habits throughout the day. And this this is doesn't matter what you eat for the rest of the day. If the, if you start with protein and fiber, you're going to do better off than if you had not. So it's a great way to start the day. Well, don't you think too, like even people that uh, initially go into veganism, like they, it's the fiber that probably makes the most impact yeah, in terms of like what's been deficient in the It is diet. a lot of times, 100%. And, you know, like the opposite of that being carnivore, where it's like you don't have something that's triggering your autoimmune response, you know, so aggressively. And so it's like, it's funny because it, we get trapped there. Like this is, this is it. I'm an evangelist. This is my thing. Uh, when in fact, it's just highlighting something that was a deficiency. Now, there's the, the big barrier to what we just said, you know, start your day off with uh, high protein and fiber. The barrier for most people, this is for all day, but especially in the morning is time. It's always time. Oh that's my God, why, I get up in the That's why the move is the creature's a habit, dude. That's yeah. the creature's habit, oatmeal with a, and you could even add, Super easy add a half a cup or a cup of blueberries in there too. So that'll boost it even more. Yeah, because it's got a, one a cup of nitro cold brew. Yeah, because one serving, oh, let me see, if I pull up the ma if I pull up the macros of it. Uh, on what, on uh, creatures? Yeah, so I think Andrew sent, oh, here we go, I got it. So one packet of this oatmeal has 30 grams of protein, and nine grams of fiber. So, so you're one, getting one third of your fiber for the day, yeah. and and a nice shot of protein for the day. Right? Yeah, and it's got adequate carbohydrates, so you get the fuel. It's got some fat in there, some healthy fats, and it's fast. Because I know that's an issue. People are like, oh my god, okay, protein, fiber. I got to cook, I got to prep, I got to make sure I have. That's an extra like mm -hmm. twenty minutes in the morning. I got to get the kids ready or whatever. It's like not anymore. Now you throw some microwave, add water, milk, macadamia nut milk, almond milk. And then, boom, you get that. And really, it's about um, how it affects the rest of your day. It makes a huge difference when it comes to satiety that um, this, again, this was, like a, this was like a game changer for me. I would tell clients to hit these targets and start their day off this way. And then what I did, and this took me a long time to pay attention to because I was so like, I'd be so focused on just like specifics. Then later on, I took this kind of broader view. Like, wow, when we start the day this way, the trend tends to look like this. Like, wait a minute, I wonder if this is what's causing it. And then I'd experiment with my clients. Hey, start your day off with this. Start your day off with that. And then I'd see, like, tr patterns. And, man, you start off with protein and fiber, like, the rest of the day would always look better than had they not. It's yeah. just one of those things. Oh, for, like, three years, that Managed was my blood sugar, everything. Yep, yep. Staple yeah. meal. Yeah. All the, the oatmeal with protein. This was before Creatures of Habit, right? You'd make your own. That was it. I mean, every, every day. Heavily processed foods typically bad for you they promote overeating okay basically they make you fat now here's the deal you can't totally avoid them are there processed foods that are better than others yes here's the mo most important thing you should consider find heavily processed foods that are very high in protein that'll help mitigate the effects of heavily processed foods it'll help you not overeat them and at least it's going to help you hit your protein targets Two trigger warnings in one intro. That's Why? not bad. Uh, well, you said fat, and then you said that bad food. Those oh, are two, yeah. two things that That's will weird. set people off. Right? Right. People don't like to hear fat anymore. No, you, can't, you can't say it's that. It's a fun anymore. word. Yeah, you can't say that anymore. You're, it makes you out of pussy? Yeah. Wow. Uh, that sounded terrible. Less fit. That sounded Less <laughs> fit. Less, yeah. <laughs> Less fit. How about that? Squishy. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, Got here's it. a deal. Like, uh, So the, 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 main, the main problem with heavily processed foods isn't necessarily that they're inherently unhealthy. Um, now, for the most part, they are less healthy than whole natural foods, but that's not really the main issue. The main issue is that they make you overeat. That's just the bottom line. And, and they're, they're really, really powerful in this respect. I mean, studies show pretty consistently that people will eat like five or 600 more calories a day, even if macros are controlled, if they eat heavily processed foods. So um, this is a pretty big deal. That's a big deal. That's like if you're trying to put someone on a bulk uh, or trying to cut someone, typically that's the amount of calories that you work with. But if you can choose a food that's heavily processed, that's mostly protein, then you're going to have um, a better a better chance at not overeating because protein is so satiating. Yes, yeah. and this is why, by the way, most snack foods, which are all pretty much heavily processed foods, why most snack foods are not uh, protein based because. They don't uh, make as much money. People don't overeat them like they do things like potato chips and crackers and well, cookies. Well, I think the biggest consideration here is like if you're traveling, especially if you're like on the freeway yeah. and a long drive and it's like you got gas stations, you got whatever like garbage out there that you have as options. Like I'm always kind of looking for something like a beef jerky or something a little yes. more on that side uh, in, in terms of like a processed option. Yes. Yeah. Well, how do you guys do? Is there like a 
hierarchy that you tell clients uh, as far as processed foods, or is there like certain guidelines that you tell them? Like, you know, because it's it's impossible, I think, for somebody to eat a hundred percent whole natural foods all the time. I think it's inevitable that you're going to have a day where you travel, a day where you didn't meal prep or the food that you did meal prep, it's, now you're it, out of meals. It's like, highly improbable for sure. Yeah, it's like, I just, and so I think what I was always challenging clients is like, let's let's just call a day where you hit your macros and it's all through whole foods is what is is perfect and the goal always. And anything, any and for every processed food that comes in there, healthy or not, meaning protein bars, shakes, things like that, it, we're, we're starting to get away from what we would consider 100% day. And yes, if that happens occasionally because you were you know, on the road or flying or whatever, that's fine. Then we get right back on the wagon the next day and then we're, we're going after it. Yeah, no, I would tell my, you, you picked the, my favorite one, Justin, which is uh, like jerky, you know, um, that is hard to overeat. Mm-hmm. Like, have you ever had a client where you look at their diet and you're like, oh, here's why you're eating too much. You're eating too much jerky. I would never <laughs> said have, nobody. Yeah. That would never happen. And you can find jerky nowadays pretty much everywhere. And now there's companies that make really good uh, type of, you know, jerky grass-fed. type. Yeah. Like Paleo Valley has grass fed meat sticks and they're not dry. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people are like, I don't like jerky. It's too dry. It's hard to chew or whatever. That never really bothered me, but you know, you try like these grass fed meat sticks and they're like, they're really good. They hit it out the park. Do you guys remember when, before we partnered with them, like we got sent Epic, we got sent, um, another popular brand, a bunch of, a bunch of companies. Yeah. I don't know. Probably four different, uh, jerky companies. And, and I remember, and Paleo Valley was not the first one. And like, we really wanted to do jerky, but I was like, man, these ones are just, you know, Sal will almost eat anything. So he's like, gets excited right away. Right. Like, Oh, this is good. Everything's good. It's like, is it free? Ah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's <laughs> really, if it's healthy and it's free, those are Sal's qualifications what? right there. <laughs> it's healthy and it's free. Like, Oh, this is so good. It's yeah. like, well, I've had quite a bit better jerky. Yeah, I you know? don't, I don't have the palate. Of but a when, a hey, when, when Paleo Valley <laughs> came around and they sent us jerky, I remember everybody was so like, good. Oh damn. Like, you know, what's crazy. Delicious. Too? You know, what's crazy too. They have the, uh, so they have the beef ones and they have the turkey ones. Mm. Yes. And I would normally think like I'm going to go beef, right? The turkey ones I like more. Yeah, well, the turkey yeah, ones are super flavorful. Well, because it's not like super dried out. Like turkey is always like like just like totally like cardboard kind of meat. It's the worst me. meat. Yeah, it's like the worst. Yes. And, but somehow they got it to uh, they they mastered it. Where yeah. it's still isn't the juicy. turkey one like a, like one gram higher in protein too? For some reason, a little bit more protein and a little less, 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 less fat. yeah less calories too. Yeah, right, so yeah. it's a little less calories and a little more protein. But yeah, when I travel and even with my kids, um, when I'm packing snack, because you know you know one of the values of processed foods is that they have a long shelf life. They're easy to travel with. You can carry them anywhere. You don't have to refrigerate them. So that's, I'm like meat sticks. If I go somewhere, meat sticks. If I, if my kids need snacks, yep. you know, meat sticks and you're getting protein, it's, it produces satiety. Like if I eat, if I want a snack and I go to a gas station and I get a bag of chips and some candy, I'm not going to feel nearly as satiated as if I eat two meat sticks, mm-hmm. like two meat sticks will be more satisfying to me and it's less calories, more protein. Yeah. What's your thoughts on doing that? Even if you're going to do so, for example, last night, I actually, uh, I was a little low on my calories. So I had room for more calories for the day. Uh, Katrina and I are, are watching a movie. Uh, she wants popcorn. I want popcorn, but I have, uh, the beef jerky stick first yes. before I eat the popcorn. Yes. I notice a huge difference on the amount of popcorn that I end up eating. You know what's that, funny? Not to mention I get an extra, you know, whatever it is, 12 or whatever grams of protein. You know what's funny about that? It's so counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. You're like, I'm going to eat more to eat less. R- right. No, like you, you literally are, if you do it first, by the way, this is a trick for just any meal you eat, any meal you eat, if you have your proteins and your carbs and your fats, and sometimes it's the proteins and fats come together, right? So it's like steak or something. If you just eat the protein first, you're probably going to eat less than if you didn't do that in the first yeah. place. If, so I, I, that's what I do with my food. I'll have it all, you know, parsed out and then I'll go just the protein and then I'll leave it. Now, if I'm trying to bulk, it's funny. If I'm trying to bulk, I'll flip it. Or I'll mix it all up because I know I can eat more calories, mm. you know? Otherwise, I get too too full. If I eat the big steak first and I move on to the, the rice and stuff, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm choking yeah, it down. Yeah, but if I'm point. trying to maintain a lean body weight, um, then that's what I do. So that's – and I wanted to say that uh, that, that fit tip because uh, you're right. It's, it's so hard to avoid processed foods. And then it's like 
you know, I'm traveling like, you know, what am I going to do? Like everybody just thinks nuts. Like mm-hmm. I'll just take nuts with me. Nuts are better than others, but they're not the greatest. You could overdo you get calories, calories really fast. Yeah, yeah, it gets away from you. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then I, I know I say this all the time, like a broken record, but when the FDA allows it to be 20% off and you are doing that once or twice every day for a week, you're talking about 10 to 14 yes. meals that have potential of being 100 to 300 potentially calories off. Like, boy, that really starts to add up for some, and a lot of times, when I and this is and this took me a while to get to this point as a coach, you know I'd have clients that would report back though oh I'm I'm hitting everything why am I not why is the scale not moving why am I not losing mm-hmm. body fat, and come to find out you know it was those two or three meals and just simply maybe going okay listen I, I'm not going to change anything as far as your macro targets I just the goal is for the next two weeks can you give me two weeks of like mm-hmm. no eating out just just eat everything you've made yourself and but you can st- exact same amount that were you're supposedly reporting and they always inevitably would would lose and yes. you would see a difference. Yes. And so, you know, that that to me just highlights how far off we can be when you are you're consistently eating package processed totally. or out. All right, here's something that can help you out when it comes to your health. When you're introduced to novel foods, foods that humans haven't eaten for like thousands of years, foods that basically have come into the horizon in a new time or modern times. When you're looking at those foods, remember this, guilty until proven innocent. I know the opposite is how we talk about our justice system, but when it comes to new foods, assume they're bad until they're proven, absolutely proven that they're fine, that they're okay. Doing this will probably save you a lot when it comes to your health. So remember the term, guilty until proven innocent. I got this one for Max. I didn't think. Uh, did he actually say it like that? He did. Oh, he yeah, did. Max Lugavier taught me this. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I love I, it. I don't. Was that when we were in London? He said that to you. I don't. He even did, remember. and I wrote it down, and I put his name under it because you guys teased me and said that I take quotes and don't. Oh, <laughs> and don't go, don't I mean, I actually don't remember credit that, that like nor it. did I have any idea where you were going with that yeah. whatsoever. But I do like that. Um, I do like that philosophy. Like yeah. I think that it's when, it, at least in regards to nutrition, I yes. think that. We're so quick to uh, jump on the the newest, uh, you know, supplement. We're always so quick to jump on to uh, a bar because it meets the macros um, versus going like, you know, ideally. And th- you've heard me talk about this on the show many times. Like that's my thought process. I even talk about shakes and protein bars this way that mm-hmm. that's not considered a perfect day for me. Even right. if I hit my macros that I would be following uh, if, if it was done with shakes and bars, it's not a perfect day. A perfect day for me is could I hit my macros and could I do it through whole foods? And then how many of those days can I string together? To me, that was always the goal when I was competing was like trying to string as many of those whole food days of hitting macros. And it doesn't mean I beat myself up because I had to have a protein shake or sure. a bar. It's just that I, I realize and recognize that eating whole natural foods is always going to be superior uh, for overall health, not necessarily for body composition mm-hmm. and losing weight on the scale, but overall health, we're, we're just not going to be able to yeah, beat all, whole foods. Well, I know it's not, a, it's not as popular because, you know, artificial sugars in our space are like sort of uh, highly contestable. Yeah. Like the, and, you know, there's people that are are very much trying to um, sway their, their clients more in that direction because it's lower calorie, and but it's not innocuous. And so there's this is one of those newer kind of segments of like sweeteners and like brand new things that they introduce into the market. We don't know the long-term effects of uh, some of these chemicals. Yeah, well, it's also uh, food doesn't just affect our physiological selves. It also affects us mentally. Uh, I mean, like, like you used artificial sweeteners, right? No calories, okay? So you take it, well, okay, so it's nothing. It just goes through the body. But if it was nothing, you wouldn't use it. Why do you use it? It gives you the perception of sweetness. Can perceiving sweetness alter your behaviors? Of course it does. Otherwise, you wouldn't seek it out. And what are those potential effects long-term on your behaviors, your eating habits, and so on? So this conversation with Max happened because we were talking about uh, seed oils. Mm. There's a big debate on seed oils, right? And they're like, oh, the data shows it's fine. Other people are like, well, they're not good because in order to consume seed oils in the quantities that we do... Uh, we have to process the hell out of them. It's like uh, modern industrial technologies are able are, are what allow us to eat, you know, lots of you know rapeseed oil or canola oil or whatever, right? Um, that whole process probably not good. But then again, you have the people on the side who are saying, well, the data so far isn't showing that it's bad. And Max said, look, here's a deal. 
there are better oils that are already out there. We know olive oil. We've been eating it for thousands of years. Requires yeah. almost no processing. You squeeze an olive, there's the oil. And the data is very clear on the health benefits of all of us. So it's like, why choose this thing over here that humans have not really been eating in large quantities for more than, let's say, 60 years or so over something that we know for sure is a good thing? And then he said, I like to use the term guilty until proven innocent. When a new food or new process emerges, uh, then it's probably better. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to be 100%, but it's probably better to assume it's not good until it's unequivocally, right? Completely unequivocally proven to be totally okay. Now, the reason for this is that we, we, we co-evolved with our food. So all the food that we've eaten for thousands and thousands of years, right? So like animal proteins and plants and grains that don't require tons of processing, right? We've eaten those for thousands of years and our bodies over those thousands and thousands of years have evolved with these foods so we know they're okay. All, novel foods like a Pop-Tart, yeah, a Pop-Tart is made with other ingredients and all that stuff, but uh, Pop-Tarts have been around for how long? 100 years maybe or 50 years? Uh, probably safe to assume it's not going to be great for you. This is true for all foods that haven't existed for a long time. It's better to assume that they're guilty until proven innocent. And that'll lead you more often than not. I'm not, I'm not saying it's perfect, but more often than not, that's going to lead you in the right direction. And I like that he said that. I think mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense because do we have hard data that shows that seed oils are super bad for you? No, there's some data that might suggest it and other data that suggests it might be okay. But uh, there's nothing unequivocal. There's nothing like total unequivocal. Like we've been having these for 200 years. We got all this data you know, over generations, it looks like it's totally safe. We're not there yet. So let's just assume it's probably worse for us than like olive oil. At least know? keep an air of caution, right? Yes. Like at least like sparingly uh, with some of these more modern foods that, that uh, came out um, it, and lean more heavily upon the, the whole foods where we know like over uh, centuries, like yeah. people have done well. With well, I, I think you can have, it, you can also have like a moderate attitude about this too, right? It's like, it's so, it reminds me of politics so much, right? You, you either have to be way left or way right. It's like, no, I'm yeah. somewhere in the center in this. Like, I absolutely, I'm drinking something right now that has, you know, artificial sweeteners right. inside of it. So mm -hmm. you can, you can, and I, and if someone asked me, Hey, is that a health drink? I would say, no, it's not. And I'm, I'm aware yeah, of you're that. You're not pretending. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. I think I feel like that's the hardest part about communicating about the seed oils or any of these foods that are highly processed is that, listen, I feel like I can communicate that it's, I know it's not ideal for my body at the same time too. I'm not demonizing it and saying like, I would never touch something like that. And I think that's, I think that's no, the you way prioritize I prioritize like. the right stuff. I right. That's the idea. Exactly. I think that's how I'd, I'd prefer to communicate it. It's like, listen, again, 100% day looks like a day where I don't have to use any real processed foods. It's all whole natural foods. And I've uh, been able to hit my macros. Now, does that happen every single day? No, it doesn't happen every single day. But I also am not fooling myself into thinking that when I have all these processed foods and artificial sweeteners and things in my diet, that I consider that completely feeding my body ideally like there's still a better version and then and i feel like that's how we talk about fitness all the time it's like yes. i'm always striving to be a better version of myself every single day i'm not also going to beat myself up every time that doesn't happen to be a perfect day i think you can be somewhere in the middle of this conversation and you don't have to be this you know dogmatic person who's just like demonizes vegetables and all you eat is carnivore or you don't have to be this i'll never touch any of that hippie or you have to be this person who justifies it and then they consume non-stop all day long all these artificial sweet it's like i don't know i'm somewhere in the middle of this conversation. yeah no I, I like what you're saying i mean look here's like heav heavily processed foods is a good example heavily processed foods contain preservatives they contain food you know uh, things that color that change the color of them so like artificial colors they have sweeteners that maybe we didn't consume thousands of years ago or, or even hundreds of years ago. So they have all these things within them and we can debate whether or not they're good or bad. And there's data that shows it probably okay. Data that might suggest it might not be okay. Some of it's animal data. Can we trust that? Let's forget that for a second. Here's what we know for sure. For sure. Heavily processed foods for sure are processed to be hyper palatable for sure. They're designed to be so irresistible to your body's senses that they will for a fact, cause you to overeat. We know this for a fact. We know that it's to the tune of about 600 calories a day. You'll consume more when all things are equal if you're consuming heavily processed foods versus whole natural foods. Okay, so why is that important? 
we evolved with certain experiences with our foods and flavors. When we hijack that, our primitive bodies don't know what to do. So all of our, our, you know, checks and balances like satiety, right? Palate fatigue, like palate fatigue is when you eat the same food for too long, you start to get sick of it. Like, you know, you eat like just a plain potato after a while, you're like, Oh, I don't want to eat anymore. That's one checks and balances. Satiety is another checks and balances, right? You eat and then you're satisfied. Oh, I don't really want to eat much more. Okay. This feeling of fullness. That's a check. Some, that's a check and balance. Well, those are gone. Those are hijacked when you eat foods that are designed to go around those things. So you eat a bag of Lay's potato chips, you'll eat way more potatoes than if you just ate plain potatoes, even though the calories are higher. In fact, with the, with the bag of chips, because of the oil that they add, you'll eat way more, you'll eat four to five potatoes worth if you really push yourself. But I'd love to see somebody do, you know, four or five plain potatoes. So that alone, so I don't, you don't need to debate with me or we don't need to go down. Like you said, the extreme path of every single ingredient. Maybe this data shows it. And here's an animal study. And what about this, that, and the other? Hmm. It's like, these foods are so addicting. They're designed to be addicting that you will overeat. And we know overeating is not good for you. So why are we even debating uh, pretty yeah. much anything else? Yeah. That's, that's like- California is you know. protecting us from red dyes. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the start. One of the absolute best foods you can eat for muscle, athletic performance, recovery, strength, is beef. Almost no other food out there matches beef in terms of its key nutrients, how easily you assimilate them. Protein, creatine, it's quite possibly close to the perfect food for athletes. So if you're looking to build muscle and strength and improve athletic performance, beef, it's it's, uh, it's a good thing to so eat. what's for dinner? I mean, I Where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> I almost said that. <laughs> beef, it's what's for dinner. I mean, where are those, those commercials been? I mean, it, where's the beef? So a, a ribeye steak yeah. covers every essential vitamin nutrient that we could potentially need? It does. I mean, okay, now I'm not advocating that you just eat beef. Uh, you could. That doesn't mean you should. But my point with this is that if you're looking at like key nutrients that people tend to lack or tend to find, uh, or nutrients that we tend to be deficient in that cause things like weakness or low energy. Yeah. B vitamins, B vitamins iron, iron, creatine, protein, protein. Yes. Uh, and grass fed meat has a great fatty acid profile. Cause one of the, one of the criticisms of beef is, oh, it's so high in saturated fat. So high in these omega fatty acids that are inflammatory. Conventional beef can be that way, but grass fed beef has a way better omega three, omega, omega six fatty acid profile. Um, and it's just leaner anyway. So it's, it's more of a protein food yes. when you compare like fatty cuts, but yeah, like if you want to get your B vitamins up and your iron, uh, and zinc and other things like that, like beef not only contains those things, but it contains very bioavailable forms of them. Cause you can get iron from plant sources. You don't absorb it yeah. nearly as well. Not even close. Like if you have like an iron deficiency or, you know, like go eat some beef. It's one of the easiest ways to, to bring it up. And then B vitamins, like I said. Yeah. And then you get your, um, organ meat, which is, you take a whole nother level to that in yeah. terms of condensed nutrients and minerals and, you know, through liver and, uh, everything else like organ meat wise, you can heart and whatnot. So organ meat's so high. You have to be careful. Not to yeah, eat too exactly. Much of it, right? Some of it. Yeah. You can overdose. Basically. Some of it. You know, what's weird about organ meat is that if you eat an organ, <clears throat> Uh, it contains the amount that contains the nutrients that your organ it, that corresponds to it need quite a bit of. For example, okay, Liver King. For, <laughs> no, you know that was his, that far. you know that was his big his big thing, right? Was it? Yeah, that well, was his, that why he ate so many balls. Yeah, yeah, no, that was like so his his big his big thing where he was traveling around all over the place and talking about how he eats like every every organ, everything from yeah. from balls, heart, everything like that is that the nutrients from that from balls goes to better testosterone production for heart goes to better heart health. Like. Well, here's how it works. Like, okay. So like heart, your heart requires a lot of a nutrient called CoQ10 eating heart. It means you're going to get a lot of CoQ10 because heart tissue contains lots of CoQ10, the brain, right? Let's say you eat brains, not advocating eating brains. I think that's probably one of the more dangerous organs well, to just because of the prions. Yeah. All that yeah. Weird stuff, but, but, uh, very high in cholesterol. Why the, the human brain is very high in cholesterol. So there's some truth in that. Now he went too far. Yeah. Uh, I don't think eating a lot of balls is going to give you well, yeah. bigger balls. Hasn't done like anything that. for Justin. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I just like the taste. <laughs> <laughs> he took it to Delicious. the next level. Uh, uh, he does it for scared. the flavor. 
<laughs> don't be scared. <laughs> but you know, when it comes to when it comes to uh, to to like foods that are like anabolic, and you know, okay, now uh, to be clear, your diet is gonna is varied. There's lots of components to your diet, so uh, you know that's that's clear. But if you have to pick one food that really meets lots of these needs and that could be labeled as anabolic, pro strength. Athletes have known this for years. Strength athletes have known this for years. Beef is a king when it comes to this. Beef, eggs, those two foods right there uh, will give you quite a bit. And uh, I've done this with clients. Well, they'll eat the same exact diet, mm -hmm. same macros and everything, and then they'll include more beef versus chicken or fish, and they notice strength gains. Usually, usually well, what happens. Even too, I know, I've heard like people kind of bring up the fact that, uh, you know, around the world, like people don't, that are in like third world countries, like they're – um, their whole value system is in, in their livestock and their animals yeah. that they they raise up and they they bring and that's like their only food source and to to you know have this blanket statement that beef is bad for you like we, what are you doing to everybody else around the world that like survives off of stupid this? but again grass fed beef uh, is is better if you eat a lot of beef like if you eat like I do I'll eat I eat on average probably half a pound to a pound of beef. On most days. So I ate a lot of red meat. So the, it's the primary source of, hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. Uh, whole food protein that I get. I go grass-fed because uh, at that level, the fatty acid profile makes a difference. Now, if you eat beef here and there, doesn't make that big of a difference, but if you eat it as often as I do, uh, like my butcher box that I get every month, like that's I would say eighty percent of the beef that I eat is comes from butcher boxes, yeah. grass fed. It's yeah. not the conventional. Stuff. I mean, we've always had our rule has been, and I've talked about it more than once on the show, so some people are probably tired of hearing it, but it's just when I'm home, we cook with the butcher box meat, and so that's my way of getting. Because the truth is, like, you'll never beat. A grain-fed fucking steak, dude. A grain-fed fatty steak. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, it's just a different level of like it's fat. It's super palatable. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Or, or like a Wagyu steak. I mean, just so palatable, the amount of fat that's in that steak. So when we eat out at a restaurant, I ate out at a restaurant the other day, like I'll order like a a grain-fed type of steak. But then when I'm home, which I'm eating home 80 to 90% of the time, right. I'm going to make a, a grass-fed choice. And I think, and what, well, the best part about Butcher Box is that they have found a way, in my opinion, to make some of the best tasting meat that is grass-fed. Because in the past, I was just turned off yeah. by grass-fed meat. You know, it it was so different that it was like, oh, I, I didn't like the it. The best from them, the one that I can almost uh, that it, almost not tell. The, the tri-tip one. Yeah. You, I know you cooked that a I lot. I had a lot of the tri-tip yeah. uh, from- uh, You do a lot of tri-tip in pork, right? Mm -hmm. I like what do you eat most from there? I do tri-tip. I'll do the steak tips. I'll do, um, I'll do a little bit of the pork chop, but- uh, what was the other one that I got into recently from them? But I mean, I have done the chicken nuggets, which was like a find, you know, from them for the kids and stuff. And for me, I'll do this liar. <laughs> I'll do liar. I steal from the kids, but I make it for the kids and I eat it hey, myself. Hey, hey, wait, you guys still I gotta eat the hell out of them too. You, hey, you still both yeah. haven't had the skillet yet. Wait till you guys have the skillet. I'm, just, I'm waiting for that. I wish you guys would hurry up and get that done because then we well, can New York strips. Because that is like. I mean, I continue to get introduced to like things that they have that are amazing. I told you, you you got Katrina to order the pork, yeah, and she did the whole like slice the middle of it and put like I forget what she put in the middle of it. Oh, like, well, she cheese, makes it a uh, cheese oh, and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah she oh, was, in there. I think bro, I've had that. So bomb. Really, she oh. folds it. She makes like a little. She yeah, she cuts it open, then she puts cheese and ham. Yeah, cheese and ham inside the middle of the the, wow. the pork tenderloin wow. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and then and then she puts something else with it. This she found some crazy recipe and. Served it up to me one night. I was like, No, I, I literally this take them. Bomb. I slice them in half Sounds to make good. them thin. I dip them in uh, egg and then. Uh, Planko or uh, panko or whatever. Uh, yeah, gluten free breadcrumbs. Yeah, panko. And then I fry them. Yeah. What's that called? German. Uh, it's a German. I don't remember what it's called. Schnitzelweisel. Oh, well, no, no. Schnitzel. Is it? Yeah. Wow, wow. you were close. <laughs> you just made up a word. It's called schnitzel. My jibber jabber sometimes pays <laughs> off. It's so, sweet. That's weird. Yeah. That's Is so that really close. what it was? Schnitzel. Oh, wow. It's called schnitzel. Doesn't that sound like a made up word? It does. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't someone think just I, made it. Yeah. yeah I don't what do you want to call this? I don't think I've had a schnitzel before. It's just, it's what I said. It's pork that's uh, fried with breadcrumbs. You know what I had last night was a hush puppy. What's in a hush puppy? Puppies. Stupid. Uh. <laughs> Stop it. Hush puppy. Yeah, I don't isn't know. That, isn't that is potato that? spuds or something? I don't know. It's like deeply fried though. It tastes like it tastes like a gluten, it tastes like a gluten ball. That's what it tastes like. I don't know yeah. what a hush puppy. Isn't that that's a southern food, right? 
Hush puppies are made of cornmeal batter with like garlic powder on your Yeah, it's like Ooh, I said, like a gl- wow, that yeah, sounds like, like a bomb. It's, it's a like, gluten whoa. bomb, bro. It definitely that is. That sounds delicious. It is though. delicious though. Yeah, we had we had one of the Did bro- you did you like fall asleep afterwards? I mean, I only had one because I just wanted to taste it because the table ordered it and I'm like, that looks that sounds kind of good. And did it had you like dip this, it in anything or you like that? Uh you have it comes with a butter, it would just you wipe it on the butter or whatever, and then it had like a jalapeno mix inside of it too. Oh god. Yeah, no, it was good. I mean, I could see myself wanting to eat a bunch of them, but I knew better. Like as soon as I bit into it, I'm like, oh, this is like a gluten bomb. I can just <laughs> yeah, tell. Yeah. You know, it's like I better stop right. You know, it's there. funny about Go sleep after you eat it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny about when you pay attention to how you feel after you eat. You stop. The, yeah. You stop craving certain foods because you know it's going to ruin your day. I mean, to me, yeah. that's for the audience that's listening, this is the biggest hack to totally. learning to make better food choices. Instead of always attaching your training and your diet to the way you look, and oh, I'm fat now, I'm lean. Oh, I'm fat now, I'm lean. Yeah. It's like, and it's all about that. Learning to connect, like how my body feels when I eat really healthy Mm -hmm. and how does my body feel when I make these other choices and being honest because so many people are not honest with themselves. There's like, yeah, my body totally accepts ice cream. Oh yeah. Yeah. It totally feels good when I eat them French fries. Like you lie to yourself and you say that, but if you really pay attention to everything from your energy, your mood, your sleep that night, water retention, bloat, like all that stuff, you and and you and you just connect to it, and you connect that's all you to it, do. and you connect to it. You'll naturally, your and, body, and then, and you'll naturally you, want it or not want that's it. That's right. Yeah. And, and sooner or later, you'll get to a point. That, and to me, this is the point that you're you're trying to get to in your in your health and fitness and nutrition journey, is to becoming that aware of it because then it makes it a lot easier. And then it also, there's times. I mean, honestly, when I'm like, oh, fuck it, I'm going, I'm going to be hurting tonight. Like this that's is how you, I, this is how I, you, I, I 100% accept it. Yes, you know? mm-hmm. this is how you create balance. <laughs> Because you're fully aware. Yeah. You're fully aware of the decisions that you're making. That's all it is. But what happens more often than not is you're at a party, you're at the park, you're doing something with your family, you see a food. And then I know, like, I got four hours left of us being out. If I eat that, it's going to ruin yeah. the rest of the time. I just don't want to eat it. And, and it's not that I can't eat it. I literally don't want to. That's what makes it so balanced. Or like you said, you're like, well, I mean... I'm at my in-laws' house. I could take a nap on the couch, so I guess I will. (laughs) Anyway. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.